are you? My name is Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides, and I am an explorer. I am a, a space explorer. I'm passionate about using the power and magic of space exploration to bring out the best in humanity. So where did this spark start? <laughs> I've had a passion for space since I was about five years old. I remember we went to Kennedy Space Center when I was really young. And um, my aunt and uncle had a coffee table book called Our Universe. It's a National Geographic picture book. And my cousins and I used to play, you know, read that. Or we couldn't even read yet, but we'd look at the pictures and we would just get excited and we'd play, play uh, space. Can you tell me about your planned suborbital space mission? Absolutely. It's very exciting. In, in 2005, my then boyfriend, George Whitesides, and I contacted Virgin Galactic about buying tickets to be a part of of their program and, and become Virgin Galactic uh, astronauts and, and do suborbital space flights. And, and for us, it's really an investment in an industry that we're both really passionate about. You know, we met at the UN Unispace 3 conference and both have this same vision for the future and what, what space can open up for the world. And we saw this as a way to, you know, other, all of our friends were, you know, getting married and buying houses. We decided to get married and, and buy space flights mm -hmm. really to really support something we really are passionate about. And you're trying to encourage this passion in children. Absolutely. Yeah, I just was giving a talk yesterday to a group of uh, little kids and it's super fun uh, to tell them about how when I was their age, I was dreaming about space, you know, and now I have a ticket to fly. It's, it's a really exciting arc to get to spark their imaginations about what they could create. And really, I, I confess to them that my ultimate ambition is that I want to take a cruise when I retire around the rings of Saturn. And I need them to grow up and build me a faster rocket because the adults haven't been able to figure out how to build a rocket that can take me to Saturn fast enough. And so I really are counting on them to, to solve that one for us. You're also a lecturer at the International Space University. Could you tell me a little bit about your work there? Yeah, it's a really fun group to get to work with because it's young people, you know, doing their, you know, postgraduate work from around the world. And it's a, it just delights me because one of my passions is, is the power of space to bring the world together. And so, you know, getting to lecture there to students from around the world about um, space tourism, space and pop culture, about the overview effect, you know, the power, the impact that space can have on shifting your perception of yourself and, of, and that feeling of connectedness with the world and everyone on it. It's just something I love to share with them and, and get people talking about sort of the human side. I work in the humanities department, so we work to talk about my favorite subject, which is the human side of space exploration. And you're also working for Galactic Unite, and the work there also covers the the, the side of trying to inspire children into to this area. Yeah, Galactic Unite is... is is lovely. It's um, you know, it was created by the customers of Virgin Galactic, and you know, um, funded by the customers of Virgin Galactic, and they put together scholarships to help uh, girls go study STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math subjects at university. Um, and it, we do Google Hangouts between customers, you know, the future astronauts and the employees of Virgin Galactic, and groups of students around the world. And it's really lovely just to sort of get to beam into their classrooms and uh, be able to reach more students with that platform than we could if we had to actually physically drive to their school. So it's a great opportunity for us to connect with thousands of kids. You, you also work on the partnership side of Galactic Unite. Can you, can you tell me about the other organizations you work with? Yeah, we have a, a fantastic partnership with um, Land Rover Jaguar in the UK, well, around the world. And they have some great STEM outreach that they do with competitions, getting kids to design different sort of robotic systems, like with the, the Range Rover cars. And this year they had a challenge where the Range Rover had to tow the spaceship behind it, as, as we do in Mojave, you know, use the Range Rovers to tow the spaceship. So they had to sort of work out, you know, torque and angles and, and pull and be able to take it up, you know, a certain angle and, and all these different challenges. And so it's fun to see the kids, you know, seeing it real world applications for what they're studying and get to play with um, all the things we're doing. Do you work with Fragile Oasis at all? Oh, yeah, that's great. So Ron Guerin, yes, he came. So in our in my other hat as the founder of Yuri's Night, I host the event in Los Angeles every year. And Ron was our guest speaker a few years back. And it was lovely to work with him because he and I share that excitement about the power of space to shift your perspective and um, he called, you know, the or getting that orbital perspective. You know, my husband likes to say, from 400 miles up, all your problems look small. So 
get, you step back and you look back at earth and you sort of get that bigger picture. Or maybe I shouldn't be so mad about my son spilling all his Cheerios this morning. You know, I should think thinking about some of the, you know, the bigger things we're wrestling with as a species. Do you work at all with an organization called Rocket Women, which tried, tries to encourage women into STEM, set up by a lady called uh, Venita Mawaha Madal, and she's now so, working as an engineer for the European Space Agency? Oh, that's so fantastic. Yeah, I was just looking at her website, um, but no, I have never met her, or, you know, I, have, we have, I haven't been a part of that project uh, yet, so, well, but now that I am aware of what she's doing, I might have to reach out. Is there anything that you personally do to try to help and encourage specifically women into uh, space exploration, engineering, the industry overall? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of my passions is getting more women involved. Um, and, you know, as engineers um, in the industry and at leadership roles in the industry and then also um, more women in space, literally. So there's been 553 people who've flown in space um, 59 of them have been women, so about 10%. And actually, in about two weeks' time, uh, Kate Rubens will be launching on the Soyuz and flying to the International Space Station, and she'll be the 60th woman to have been in space. So we're really excited for her launch. And yeah, my passion is to, to build on those numbers. I've been doing some talks. I did a talk at the Women in Technology International Conference two weeks ago and talked to some other women in the Silicon Valley last week and just trying to keep up that message that we need that feminine energy that that uh, to balance uh you know to balance out you know how things have been going in the, in the world and add a different perspective and add a different skill set and uh i think it's really great we actually had some of our virgin galactic customers visit we had not you know we're bringing doing some tours and we had nine customers visiting mojave this week and of the nine five of them were women which is the first time I've ever been uh, in company of, of our future astronauts where the women outnumber the men. And so that was really fun as well. Um, so, yes, if you're a woman listening to this, you know, you can definitely be a part of this. Uh, there's plenty of space for everybody. What do you think the barriers are to women uh, getting into the space industry? Um, I mean, the classic barriers are, you know, just engineering departments being you know, having a majority of the students being men and just, you know, encountering faculty or advisors who say, oh, you know, you know, we're not sure this is cut out for this. or this. It's, And you see that more in other countries, but even in the United States, you can still see that. And then getting in the workplace, I think there's a more subtle effect, which is it's the unintentional bias that, you know, different research has shown that we just sort of unintentionally, even with, with our best intentions of wanting to create a diverse workforce, tend to hire people who are like us, people who went to the same school as us, people who had the same major as us, people who are from the same state as us, because it's comfortable, because you have that commonality, that that bond. Like, oh my gosh, you're from Michigan too, that's so cool. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna get along great. And so some of those effects can tend to, unfortunately, you know, have women sort of, oh, well, she was a great candidate, but you know, this other candidate, you know, he was really phenomenal. I think he's gonna be a perfect fit. He's got more of X or Y or Z, and so get in that way. And then of course, you know, the workplace, you know, one of my passions in life is making the workforce extraordinary. I want to make it like a dream place to be your dream job and have it be inspiring and challenging and fulfilling and in full communication, transparent and enlivening all the time. And of course, we're not quite there yet as, as a world. We still have more of that sort of Dilbert workplace where people are miscommunicating and getting frustrated and thwarted and resentful. And so I think, you know, there's this other pull that as women get older and, you know, maybe begin to, you know, start a family and maybe they have a little bit more financial freedom to be able to say, you know what, I am really frustrated in this workplace and with this manager who doesn't get me. And so I'm just going to stay home with the kids. And sometimes, and I think, you know, men, I think men, if they had that <laughs> total freedom, might do the very same thing be like, gosh, this manager's driving me up a wall just had a baby, I'm out of here. Um, but, you know, in many, in many situations, they can't. And so one of my goals is to create a more inviting workplace, a more flexible workplace, a more respectful workplace, where women who do have that choice of staying home or not will actually be able to say, you know, no, this was a fantastic environment. It was challenging me, it was fulfilling who I am as a human being. They're honoring my needs for flexible time schedule. Um, I'm going to make it work to go back and contribute my brains and my talents to this industry. And so I want to create. So I think that'll be an important part of expanding women. And then, of course, the leadership as well, because as women, you have more years in the industry, you'll be able to rise up to the higher levels. If you were given an enormous budget to encourage women into this area... Is there anything practical that you could do? You, you've, you've mentioned the innate biases 
the men like to group together, people like to group together from certain backgrounds. Despite those two things, if you were given an enormous budget to deal with this problem, is there something on a practical level a person could do with the right team around them in order to encourage women into this industry? Yes. So in terms of, you know, it's, it's a pipeline, right? So you have everyone from six years old to 90 years old. So that you have there's different, different solutions to different parts of the problem. I think for the youngest kids, having role models, putting images of astronauts, women astronauts and you know, women CEOs and women board members and women politicians, you know, just women leaders, you know, out in front of them. So that just seems, starts to seem normal to them. Part of their world um, is at the earliest piece. Shifting the light. And I think on, and a lot of it is in TV and, and movies as well. You know, shifting, you know, having messaging like the one character says, you can't do that. That's a girl thing, or that's a boy thing. And then having the other character or the wise character pointing out that, you know, no, it's, it's a human thing. We're all doing this. We're all in this together to sort of try to retrain that language that they might be hearing um, in their environment and have a new generation growing up with a new language and new way to think about gender is the next piece. Um, and then in high school and in junior high, having more opportunities, I think having girl only opportunities is really powerful. I went to an all girls high school. I went to an all girls summer camp and it wasn't a punishment. I mean, it was an opportunity. I mean, I was, we were treated like royalty, you know, we, we were treated as important, as special, as, as exciting and as the future. And, you know, we had our own valedictorian, we had our own class president. We didn't feel any competition, any subjugation. We were just powerful. And I also had the opportunity to be a counselor at the Sally Ride Science Camp, which is targeted at junior high girls. It's a girls only science camp. And that was also fantastic because for a junior high girl to be in a girls only environment where you're doing science and technology and engineering, and you're building robots and you're launching rockets and you're at Stanford University and you're surrounded by smart people and it's cool to be smart and it's normal to be smart. <laughs> That's a really important experience. You know, my... Um, life even a week a year where you're in that environment where you're understood and heard and listened to is who you are and valued for who you are that's enough to carry you through the whole year of like regular life if you know you have those people who have your back that maybe you could go back to next summer as well and so i think if i had unlimited funds i would def i would create these one week opportunities in the summer for girls and fund you know having the most amazing pump in you know speakers being able to come and mentor them and inspire them you know, that you could fly them in and you could pay them a speaker fee and they don't have to do it out of the kindness of their heart. But you're like, no, we are, this is something we're investing in because it's important. And then even funding so that girls who can't afford to go on their own would be able to attend. And if you could do a thousand of those camps around the country, that would definitely be the video. So if a Microsoft is, is listening. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Microsoft, please. Happen. <laughs> or a virgin, a Richard Branson. <laughs> Funding is needed for that area. Can you take us back to your childhood? Where did this confidence, this drive come from? When did you decide you can do it all, that you're just as good as the boys? I am very lucky. I am very lucky. It wasn't until college. I, you know, when I got to Stanford, one of the, I was, I was sharing this the other week, one of the most interesting, one of the most favorite memories was having to be told that being a woman was a disadvantage because I never, I never, I never encountered that thinking before. I had no idea that even existed. You know, when I saw the 1984 Olympics, I was 10 years old and the women, I was watching the women's marathon and it was very dramatic. It was very historic. You know, she tripped and fell and she got up and she kept running and she got the gold and we were cheering. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I even learned that that was the first time women were allowed to run the Olympic marathon. And that even in the seventies, she'd had to train, you know, got punched out in the Boston marathon for running as a man, um, somebody found her out and, and like, you're not allowed, women aren't allowed here. And I just sort of grew up sheltered from all that. I didn't, I didn't know any of that was happening. I just took it for granted that that was normal and that women flew on the shuttle and that women ran in the marathon in the Olympics and women, you know, were running for vice president in that, at that, in that era. What do I attribute that to? My mom is an incredibly powerful woman. Uh, my, uh, my sister is an incredibly powerful woman. Could you tell me a little bit about your mom and your sisters? My mom runs the household. I mean, my dad would, you know, he'd come home with a check and he'd be like, what do I, you know, where do I deposit this? And my mom would say, well, just, you know, take it out to the bank and you can deposit it there. And he's like, well, wh where's our check? What bank is our checking account with? You know, because my mom ran everything and that was just normal to me um she didn't take black from anyone she she was well known in the community she 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 was running things at the, the school the parent board and just fundraising and
running up nets. So yeah, she was just unflappable. My sister, you know, she rides a motorcycle. She backpacked around the world by herself for a year. She's got tattoos and, you know, the boys, when I was in high school, the boys would be scared to come over to my house, you know, not because of my dad, but because of my sister. <laughs> um, and so that was just, you know, she's just an alpha, you know, people think I'm really strong and confident. I'm like, well, you haven't met my sister. So to me, there's just the world I grew up in. I grew up around a lot of powerful women. I had some incredible teachers, um, you know, Sister Ursula in fifth grade, she taught me math and she was just a genius. And then there's just there's this quiet power and, you know, Miss Allen, you know, Miss Quinn, you know, just this incredible range of teachers I had in, in high school and in grade school, Miss Ryan. It just taught me that it was okay to be great. It was okay to be powerful. And then my summer camp, of course, like I said, that week a year, that was where I learned how to be myself and how it's okay to be yourself and how, you know, the relationships you have with people who love you for who you are are the most important in the world. And I got a lot of my confidence from there. And I'm just, you know, to give that gift to anyone, to any to kids, and I think that would make a big difference in the world. It's like that you can go out and you can make the difference you want to make. I'd love to be able to do that for kids. Who are you currently mentoring? Uh, well, I have my own kids. I have, my son is turning six soon, and my daughter just turned four, and they're incredible. Um, and I'm also mentoring a number of the young engineers at Virgin Galactic. I lead uh, Jedi training for our early career engineers, which is a lot of fun. So at any given time, I've got my engineers there. And then, and then of course, students out in the, in the universities. I'll go speak at universities and... Um, and in the community, it's a lot of Can you take us through your career path, just uh, in summary? You did two degrees. Yeah, I, when I left Stanford, it was funny, because I, I, I like to tell a story about, I didn't know what I was going to do when I graduated from college. It's, a, you know, terrifying. But, and one of the Wisdom graduate students, he sat me down and he said, Loretta, you know, you're about to graduate. You can do anything you want. Free as a bird, really. And he said, what, what, what do you most want to do? And I said, well, I want to work in the astronaut office. And he said, great, call him in the morning. And so I did. I called up NASA Johnson Space Center, and I said, I want to work now. This is 1996. And they said, well, we're in a hiring freeze. And I said, I know. They're always in a hiring freeze. And I said, but I want to volunteer. And they that threw them for a little bit of a loop. But luckily, um, they passed me over to Mike Cade in the co-op office, and I talked to him, and you know, confirmed that I wasn't crazy. And uh, he set me up with an unpaid internship in the astronaut office. And it was fantastic. It was a great start to things and really to learn the ropes. And from there, I got a job as a contractor at Johnson working on the International Space Station. And um, after living in Texas for two years, I decided I wanted to go back to California. But it was a great, it was a great time abroad. It was very expanding of my cultural horizons. I got to go to a rodeo and everything. Uh, and then I came back and worked at the NASA Academy at NASA Ames, which was fabulous, working the summer with young students, college students from around the country. And then I just worked after that for Dr. Chris McKay at NASA Ames, who's a fantastic mentor of women and of human beings. And I really enjoyed working for him. He's very Jedi. And under Chris, I got to go to the Canadian Arctic and do some field research up in Canada um, at the Houghton Crater. And then after that, I decided to go back to graduate school to get my PhD because I wanted to be like Chris. Um, and that lasted for about two years. I worked for a fantastic advisor, Diane Newman at Caltech, in the bio as an astrobiologist, looking at life in extreme environments and bacteria. And, and but finally, with her help, you know, and and some other mentors and and coaches began to come to terms with that I'm not cut out to be a research biologist. That really my passion is people, and I love working with people. And so it took a lot of courage. It took about a year to get up the courage and the confidence to leave the PhD program and go off the beaten path. You know, I knew what I knew where that path went, and I decided to go off. It's sort of into the wilderness. It's a little bit scary, a little bit. Okay, it was really, really scary. But it's been an incredible journey. So from there, I did like an entrepreneurial program at Caltech, sort of like a soft landing. And then I ended up at X Prize Foundation when they won the Unsari X Prize when they were giving away the Unsari X Prize in Mojave. And got to be a part of that historic moment, which was fantastic. And then started with Zero Gravity Corporation, working as a flight director with them and doing the Zero G Parabolas floating wait list, which was fun. And then we moved to D.C., so I ended up working at NASA headquarters in the exploration department, which was an incredible learning experience, being in the belly of the beast at uh, inside the Beltway in Washington, learning how government influences everything we're doing I, I blogged for a while at, for wired wired science covering the space beat for them and then we moved back to california when george my husband got the job running virgin galactic and um decided to stay home we had had we had our my our son and then two years later we had our daughter decided to stay home with the kids and then just recently i've been working 
on getting back into my speaking, public speaking and volunteer work and doing consulting with intergalactic training their young engineers and working on my book, which is on the impact of space on humanity and its impact ability to a potential to shift who we are as a species. So yeah, it's been quite a quite a journey, but what I love about it now is that I get to do, um, I have a life that I designed and that I created and it's, I focus it on what I'm most passionate about and the difference that I want to make, which I feel very fortunate to be able to do. Do you have a publisher for the book? I don't. I'm still wrestling with self-publishing and, or, you know, getting a publisher and what, what direction I want to take that. So you might potentially be looking for a publisher. <laughs> Anyone <laughs> if anyone is out there listening, <laughs> well, there will be many people out there listening to this. You are looking for a publisher. Absolutely. When do you think the, the book will be completed? It's mostly written. I'm just doing edits and polishing and, and drafts. So, I'd, you know, I'd like to get it done by the end of the year. That's my goal. And one thing you didn't mention was you've also been an underwater explorer. <laughs> I forgot that part. That's a good part. When I was just leaving my PhD program, one of the other fabulous serendipities, Kismet, as my grandmother used to say, is that James Cameron, the director of Titanic and Avatar, came to NASA JPL looking for astrobiologists. And he needed people who could take a month off and take a month to go to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and a month in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on a month's notice. And most graduate students, most researchers at NASA were hard-pressed to fit that kind of a timeline, get that approved by their management, and fit it in with their research and teaching obligations and things like that. Um, but because I just left the program and I had no nowhere I had to be, I was like, you know, hey, I'm ready. So I was uh, selected to be one of the 10 astrobiologists or visiting scientists on board the, the ship, and it was fantastic. So we did a month on the Atlantic, a month in the Pacific. I got to do five dives to the bottom of the ocean, like the bottom, bottom of the ocean. Not the Mariana's Trench bottom, but like, the regular bottom, Titanic depths, it's about two miles down, it takes about two hours to get there, and it was just a, a incredible analog for space flight, because you're in a, a very small titanium pressure vehicle, pressure vessel, about, okay, a little bit bigger than a Soyuz, we don't have to have our knees in our, in our chins, um, but we have a Russian pilot, all the consoles are in Russian and Cyrillic, and, um, and you're out of range of rescue, you know, you're really off the grid, you're really outside of 911, you know, if anything happens to us, we're on our own, and, and it's a very powerful shift, you know, when you're out far enough away that they can't just medevac you in a helicopter to safety, you know, we're, no helicopters can get us, it would take three days for the coast, you know, for the Navy to reach us, and no other vehicles can descend to the depths that we were at to rescue us and we had an issue of depth. So we really, I really had to wrestle with, I'm really doing something dangerous here. You know, this is, it's not theoretical. You know, would you go to Mars one way? You know, this was, okay, are you ready to climb into this submersible and dive 5,000 meters down? So it was really a fantastic training exercise for what space life might be like. What are you most passionate about in your life? I mean, you clearly, you have this huge passion for exploration whether it's underwater up into the heavens what excites you most what annoys you most what <laughs> fires you up the most well i am a huge star wars fan i grew up on the original trilogy and it's, it's something very core to who i am you know yoda i think has a lot of wisdom that i that i like to pass on to our engineers and jedi training in, in general so what am i passionate about you know, I think a lot of people got inspired by Star Trek and Star Wars and, and other, other visions of the future growing up. And, you know, a lot of people in my industry, they grew up and they wanted to become engineers. They wanted to build warp drives. They wanted to build, you know, starships. They wanted to build, rep, you know, communicators and replicators and all these things. And I think for me, the piece of the stories that always touched me the most was the human side of the story, was the culture of Star Trek, um, the inclusiveness, peacefulness, and the wisdom of the Jedi. And so for me, it won't be enough for us to build the spaceships of those futures. I actually want to build the culture of those futures as well. And so that's my passion. That's my mission is helping create, make humanity evolve. Like as Yoda says, get past our anger, our fear and our aggression. And I like to say, become, help us become the species that any of us would be proud to send to another. What sort of mother are you? <laughs> Perfect next question. Um, angry. Yeah, so regime, regime change starts at home. You know, you gotta, so what I'm really focused on, I mean, I tell you, more than anything, is working on how to stay calm when they're driving me crazy. Because if I can't learn to 
give up anger, you know, at the breakfast table, how can I ask people to give it up around the world? So it's like, you know, the, the difference that I want to make humanity, you know, it starts so, so like demonstrably, like right in my face, in my own house, like in my own self. And so that's something I am really committed to working on as well. And if anyone has any <laughs> tips for that, I would love to hear yeah, I'm open to any support and advice I can get. What are your plans for the future? What do you want to do in the next five years? Where do you want to go? Well, in the next five years, I really would love to see us do the suborbital space flight and take that first step out into the cosmos and be able to see the, the blackness of space and the curvature of the Earth and look down on our home planet and be able to come back and share that with as many people as I can as and in the most compelling way that I can. And I want to help prepare all of the other future astronauts to have the most profound life-altering experience possible as well and be as prepared and empowered to go out and share their message and make the difference they came to Earth to make after their flights as well. Because like, we have like you know this network of space ambassadors that are going to be coming back. We have you know, over 700 customers signed up to fly with Virgin Galactic already. And so these people will start to come back from their flights. They're from all of 58 uh, different countries around the world. They speak different languages. They're from different walks of life. Um, and they'll be able to reach people who've never been reached with this message before. And they'll be able to you know, use that platform for good, You know, whether they're campaigning for clean water or children's rights or climate change or whatever it is that they're passionate about. And so being able to help them make that difference is my five-year goal. Could you explain for the benefit of the audience what the difference is between orbital and suborbital space missions is? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of my favorite explanations. So if you want to orbit the Earth, like the space shuttle, you have to be going Mach 25, 25 times the speed of sound. Um, because if you think about it, so gravity is always pulls the moon. There's, there's not, so there's not that there's no gravity in orbit. There is. And gravity is what holds the Earth in orbit around the sun. Gravity holds the sun, moon in orbit around the Earth. So there's gravity out there. But what's happening is the space shuttle is. I like to think of it as outrunning gravity. So it's sort of like a bucket of water. So if you put a bucket of water over your head, you know the water's going to fall right out of the bucket. But if you're spinning the bucket fast enough, um, the water sort of outruns gravity, and the water can, you know, orbit you without falling, without falling out of the bucket. So um, the space shuttle is basically outrunning gravity. So if, as long as it's going 25 times the speed of sound, that's sort of the speed limit of, gra of Earth's gravity, it can outrun gravity. But anything slower, and you'll fall back to Earth due to, gra to gravitational forces. So um, on a suborbital flight, on our space, on our sp on Spaceship 2, we're not going to be going Mach 24. We're only going to be going Mach 3. So we'll be going three times the speed of sound. So when we go up into space, like we'll, we'll be going, you know, out, outside the atmosphere, out into space. But um, because we're not going Mach 25, the, eventually and the force of gravity will pull us back down to Earth and back into the atmosphere. And so we'll, that's a suborbital flight. It's where you go up and come back down as opposed to orbital where you can go all the way around the Earth in 90 minutes. And you mentioned earlier that you're looking for a publisher for your new book. If you were given an enormous amount of funding from a rich corporation, you know what you would do with it. If there was one person in the world that you could meet, who would that person be? And what, and what would you ask them? Oh, that's a tough one. Part of me wants to say Lynn, Lynn Manuel, Manuel Miranda because uh, of my, I've been really just drawn into the his Broadway musical Hamilton lately just been listening to the soundtrack over and over and over again I think he's a genius um and I and the reason I only the only reason I found out about Hamilton is because he also did the soundtrack um in episode set Star, Star Wars episode 7 Force Awakens for the new cantina scene because he ran into J.J. Abrams who's the director of Star Wars and of episode 7 and he said you know if you need music for the new cantina scene I'm your guy and so I for a May four, May the fourth be with you. May fourth this year, they did a, a duet, J.J. Uh, Abrams and Lin Manuel Miranda, in outside his uh, theater in in Broadway, and I thought, oh man, this guy's cool. So that, so yeah, I, so just as a, a sort of a fan, when I'm fanboying out, um, I would say Lin Manuel Miranda. But there's, but the practical part of me also would be really interested to talk to um, Ryan Johnson and maybe the director of Episode Nine as well. Um, just because I really, I think that the next two Star Wars movies um, are a powerful opportunity to train a billion people in, in the ways of the Force. It's one of the most effective vehicles for getting ideas out in the world is Star Wars because a billion people are going to watch that movie and a lot of kids are going to watch it. And so the 
ability to put role models on screen that you we want our kids to be learning from and language on screen do or do not there is no try you know you must unlearn what you have that is why you failed you know all the things that yoda says are incredibly powerful and we can put more of that into the next movies helping give kids the tools that they need to solve conflict to work together to dream big to to avoid anger fear and aggression i mean i don't think i could make a bigger bigger mark on the world than through that uh, could you explain the overview effect? Absolutely. So Frank White wrote a book called The Overview Effect um, that I first found when I was in college, and I just I felt like it was written just for me. It's an amazing... He interviewed astronauts and cosmonauts who, after their space flights and, and, and combed through their interviews and writings and books and sort of pulled out all the places where they talk about the overview effect, this profound shift that they report having experienced, having seen the earth from space and having looked at their home planet, having walked on the moon. And, it, and the overview effect, the way Frank describes it, is a, a profound feeling of connectedness with everyone and everything. It's a shift in the way you see yourself, the way you see, the way you relate to others, the way you relate to the home planet. And, you know, not seeing the borders from space, you know, not seeing the environmental devastation, really wanting to take care of earth, you know, all those things um, tie into it. I think are a really powerful force for good that I want to make sure that I'm really excited to see us amplify by ha having more people go into space. When you take your flight on the, the suborbital spaceship and you're experiencing the overview effect, if somebody were to give you the power, looking down at the world where you've seen, where presumably you will see the negative effects of mankind, um, what would you change about the world? If, if, if there is something that you could change looking down, what do you think it would be? Oh my. From dealing with environmental damage to anything. Um, it's tough because there's so many, and that's one of the reasons I picked space is because there's so many issues I wanted to work on at once. You know, in the 80s it was like acid rain and saving the whales and the ozone hole and it's like, where do you start? You know, where do you devote your energy? And that's why I decided to devote my energy to space, because I felt like from that perspective, you know, people could have the shift in thinking that it would allow them to work on everything at once. So I think if I could do one thing, it would be to one superpower after my flight, it would be to empower everybody to go out and make the difference that they came here to make. Because I am passionate about that, like being like, okay, what are you, what are you here to do? Like, okay, it's time, let's go do it. Because I, I think if we could start a movement of people who are living mission-driven lives like that, I feel like all those things would get taken care of. You know, the people who are really passionate about climate change would go out and turn the, turn the tide on that and make it happen. You know, people who are really passionate about getting kids to do science, learn st STEAM and STEM subjects would, you know, go out and make the difference in that. People who are really interested, passionate about making sure that women's voices are being heard and women are being empowered um, throughout all arenas would be making that happen. And so I think that's where I would start. I think that's where I would best be able to leverage the difference that I want to make in the world is by getting up underneath and empowering all these people to work on all these different issues that I care about simultaneously. Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> My pleasure, thank you so much.